now we've got our next reading, which is from Tony Kellner. Um, this is the from the beginning of the Family Skeleton series. Uh, the first book is called A Skeleton in the Family. Um, Tony also writes under the name Lee Perry. And the, as just to remind you, each of the authors um, gave us a reading. Yes, Sid. <laughs> uh, each of the authors uh, chose a piece that, uh, of their writing that they wanted you to sort of have in mind and to be thinking about that we will refer back to in our, in our panel on talking about, you know, how they think about world building. And so without further ado, I give you uh, the beginning of Skeleton in the Family. Uh, and basically, it's, it's time for Sid. <laughs> With the most urgent of the unpacking complete, I set up my laptop on the coffee table in the living room to make sure the internet connection was up and running and ended up getting caught in a flurry of email. That meant I was concentrating on the screen and didn't see the door to the armoire behind me slowly drift open, and the noise of my typing masked the sound of movement as the skeletal figure emerged from the gaping blackness. Had the worn oriental carpet not muffled the footsteps, I would have heard the feet scraping against the floor as the creature stepped into the room, even though his feet were bare. In fact, they couldn't have been any more bare. Bare of clothing, bare of skin, bare of anything. There was only bleached white bone from head to toe, or rather from skull to phalanges. Like something out of a nightmare, the skeleton moved across the floor. It stepped toward my unprotected back, one fleshless arm reaching for me. But an instant before that mockery of a human hand touched my shoulder, I saw his reflection on my computer screen. Sid, I'm working here. How did you know, the skeleton demanded. How long have I known you? I wasn't about to tell him about the reflection or he'd think of a way around it next time. Hey, can you blame me for wanting to jump your bones? Get it? Jump your bones? I got it the other thousand times you made that joke, Sid, and it hasn't been funny since the first time. I sent off the email I just finished typing and said, so do I get a hug or what? I wasn't sure you'd care since you didn't even bother to come up to the attic to see me. You weren't in the attic, were you? You didn't know that. I suspected I lied. <laughs> Years back, my parents had bought the battered but sturdy armoire for Sid to use as an emergency hiding place for those times when he couldn't get upstairs to the attic without being seen. And my sister Deborah had installed locks inside and out so nobody could open it unexpectedly. In addition to hiding in there, Sid wasn't above using it for a spot of eavesdropping. His hearing was excellent despite his lack of ears. I went on. I had to wait to make sure that the coast was clear, which is your fault since you're the one who wants to keep Madison from finding out about you. He sniffed as if to say he suspected I'd been stalling. It made no sense for a skeleton to sniff, but of course there wasn't anything about Sid that did make sense. When your best friend is a walking, talking human skeleton, you pretty much give up the expectation of logical explanations and just stick with the reality of his existence. If I'd been older when Sid rescued me, I'd probably have been traumatized for life. But as a six-year-old, I'd still firmly believed in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and the Tooth Fairy. Adding an ambulatory skeleton to my roster of childhood heroes wasn't that much of a stretch. Though later evidence had proven to me that those other guys weren't real, Sid was still a part of my life. I repeated, do I get a hug or not? I suppose, he said, but the hug was more sincere than his words. Hugging Sid is an unusual sensation. The closest thing I've ever felt to it was wrapping my arms around a really dried out Christmas tree so I could lug it out to the street. Sid didn't have that nice ascent, but then again, he didn't leave an annoying trail of pine needles either. Did you lock the front door in case Madison comes back early, Sid asked. No, but I will. I did so. Sid, are you sure you want to play it like this? I know Madison is ready to hear about you. Sid and I had agreed when Madison was born that it would be best if we waited to let them meet face to skull. It wasn't that he was overly terrifying in appearance. In appearance. My father's great aunt Margaret, who used a pound of white face powder a week and dyed her hair to the darkness of a black hole, was much scarier. We just didn't want to rely on a child to keep the secret of Sid. But when Madison turned a mature 10, I was ready to introduce them during our annual visit to my parents. Sid vetoed it and had continued to do so. He said he didn't want to disturb the status quo, that it was too much to put on her, that Madison was too young, that Madison was too old. The reasons just kept on coming, and I'd reluctantly respected his wishes, even if I didn't understand them. That didn't mean I'd given up, of course. Besides, I said, it's going to be tough hiding you long term without my parents to run interference if Madison hears anything suspicious from the attic. It'll be hard on you, too. Don't worry about me, I'll be extra quiet. But there's no reason to keep you secret. Madison is old enough to be trusted. Just wait until you get to know her. 
I'd like to, he said wistfully, but let's not pile too much on her at once. Making new friends and settling into a new high school is more than enough for a girl her age. She's used to changing schools, Sid. Though I wasn't proud of the fact that my employment record had meant she'd had to switch schools mid-year more than once, I was glad that she didn't seem to have suffered from it. She can handle- How was the move? Sid asked, firmly changing the subject. I sighed. He was one stubborn bag of bones. About the same as usual, except that the landlord tried to sniff me on the security deposit. Unfortunately, I had photos of the day we moved in and could prove that the stains in the carpet predated us. I did far too much experience with sneaky landlord tricks. Not that all landlords I'd had were bad, I still exchanged Christmas cards with a couple, but because of my job, Madison and I usually lived in college towns, and dealing with college students can make even the most hospitable landlord turn cynical. He finally said he'd email the deposit back, but when I pointed out that our lease said he had to pay on the day we moved out, he just happened to have a check in his pocket, which I cashed before leaving town just in case. Besides, I needed the money to pay the visa bill. Before I could return to the subject of introducing Sid to Madison, he asked, ready to start your new job? You have no idea. I'd nearly given up on finding a teaching job for the fall. I thought I was all set for another year at the previous college, so being let go after writing up lessons plans for the summer session had caught me off guard. Weren't you on tenor track anyway? You sound like my beloved sister. Sorry. I waved it away. It's the same old story. They gave me five sec sections of freshman expository writing each semester with a textbook I hadn't worked with before and no assistant to help grade all those essays. And even though I got top marks from the students and peer review, they wanted to know why I hadn't published any papers while I was there. Apparently, because I had to sleep wasn't considered a legitimate excuse. That's insane. I have no brains at all, literally, and I can see that's insane. That's life in academia. Though I'd networked like crazy, I'd had no luck lining up a new job for the fall and had been filling in the gap by teaching high school students how to improve their SAT scores. Then one of McQuaid's instructors got an offer that was lucrative enough to make her leave on short notice. I'd exchanged small talk and business cards with the department chair at a campus function last year, which is why he'd called me. Since I was more than ready to leave that subject behind, I said, anyway, about Madison. But as if she'd heard my voice, I got a text from the 14-year-old herself, on the way. Madison will be back soon. Are you sure? But Sid was already heading for the stairs. Come up tomorrow after work. I want to know how it goes. Will do. You know, I think she's here. He zipped up the stairs and I zipped toward the door, but there was no Madison to be seen. He'd fooled me. Time was when I could see right through Sid, metaphorically as well as physically, but somehow my best friend was hiding something. So that's the end of our, our teaser section uh, from, from Tony's book, A Skeleton in the Family. This is all we're gonna, all we're gonna get about Sid for now, though of course you can, you can uh, buy, I believe, six of these books now. Uh, I think we're up to uh, the Skeleton Stuff's so Stocking, uh, which is book six um, that are available on, on Amazon, local booksellers. 